Hi, everybody, and welcome to this uh, sponsor session on uh, uh, advanced solutions for uh, treating tricuspid insufficiency. And particularly, we will uh, uh, talk about the G4 uh, revolution. I'm here together with uh, uh, three experts in the field. My name is Francesco Maisano. I work now in Milano, and I'm with uh, uh, Patrizio Ancelotti, uh, from, with Philip Lourdes, and with Georg Nikeni together. Uh, the uh, objective uh, here, here we are all together, so just wave. Um, the objective of the session is to share uh, knowledge around this uh, new evolution of the uh, system. G4 system uh, it has been already introduced for the mitral, now it's available also for the tricuspid. And so triclip uh, G4 uh, is the latest uh, version for the edge-to-edge -edge repair in the tricuspid position. We will uh, also have uh, support from Fabien Praz, who is going to be the chat master uh, from Bern, and uh, will be uh, your link to uh, connect with uh, our speakers and to make sure that uh, all the questions will be answered and all the doubts uh, will be solved if possible. Uh, let's start with uh, the first question, the first doubt, which is, uh, do we really know, do we really understand tricuspid disease? And uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Patrizio Lancelotti uh, lecture on this topic. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you at your PCR meeting. Uh, let me share with you a few understanding about the tricky speed valve and the tricky speed regurgitation. So I have no conflict of interest with this presentation. And obviously what is important to know about the tricky speed regurgitation is first of all the anatomy and the valve analysis of the tricky speed valve, the epidemiology and the prognosis, as well as the importance of multi modality imaging into the assessment of the tricky speed valve and some of the therapeutic options that will open the door to a new intervention like percutaneous intervention. So first of all, what is of importance is to clearly understand uh, the complexity of the tricky speed valve that is made of three uh, different uh, leaflets. Uh, the most, uh, I would say, largest one is uh, the anterior leaflet, and the one that is used for grasping is often the septal leaflet. But importantly is to keep in mind the relationship with the other structure, with the neighboring structure, where they could have some uh, uh, injuries, especially with the right coronary artery, but also structure as the bundle branch. Uh, regarding the anatomy, you can see in this uh, three uh, different uh, images and videos that with 3D echo, we can clearly understand the tricky speed valve better than with 2D echo, with the connection with the annulus, the right ventricle, and also the subvalvular apparatus. And with the M-phase view, we can use the ventricular view and the atrial view, like uh, the surgical view, in order to clearly highlight the three uh, leaflets of the tricuspid valve, which is of importance, especially when we consider to use uh, a percutaneous intervention. So what about the etiology? Etiology is mainly related to secondary tricuspid regurg, which means uh, without any intrinsic structural amenities of the valve, mainly in the context of left valve disease. But also look at this, we have more or less 8-10% of patients with uh, what is called atriogenic uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitations in the context often of atrial fibrillation. Regarding the uh, outcome, it is important to mention that uh, the prevalence of uh, the tricuspid regurg is important. And is important because it increased with age, but also with sex, with the female sex. And also it is associated with the outcome. And when we look at the prevalence, we can say that uh, corresponding to a US age and sex adjusted prevalence, we have more or less 0.55 persons, which is not really an infrequent condition. 
And when we look at the intervention in these patients with tricuspid regurg, we can see that just a few of them receive a tricuspid regurgitation uh, intervention in terms of uh, tricuspid surgery. So this means that uh, in this condition, the tricuspid regurgitation is highly prevalent, but often undertreated. And this is also the same in case of isolated tricuspid regurgitation. Now, regarding the outcome, it is clear that the risk of all cause mortality is increased when there is a tricky speed regurg, and especially in those with severe uh, tricky speed regurgitation, regardless of the presence of other comorbidities like pulmonary hypertension or other conditions like atrial fibrillation. And that when we look at the guidelines, of course, guidelines are easy. If you have severe tricky speed regurg, isolated primary or secondary, and uh, symptoms, this requires intervention. In the other case, when the tricky speed analysis is dilated and there is an intervention on the left side of the valve, of course, in that condition, there is also an indication for surgery. And uh, importantly to mention is that we need three important aspects for tricky speed regurg. We need first to assess the severity of the tricky speed rigor, the right ventricular size and function, and also the presence of pulmonary hypertension. And for the grading of tricky speed regurgitation, often we refer to European or American guidelines, and we need to clearly identify the different parameters that could be associated with the severity of tricky speed rigor. This means that we need to use multiparametric imaging and multiparameters as highlighted also in the American guidelines, where we can clearly identify those with severe tricky speed regurgitation. So when you have more than mild tricky speed regurg, effort should be made to quantify the severity of the tricky speed regurgitation using the vena contractor with, but also using the PISA method. Now, regarding the severity of tricky speed regurg, and when we look back at the literature, we can say that, of course, if you have severe tricky speed regurg, the outcome is impaired. But even in those with severe tricky speed regurg, we can subclassify these patients into two, three different categories according to the more severity of the tricky speed regurg. And the proposed uh, classification is more granular. Into the severe patients with tricky speed regurg, you can have massive and torrential, and these two massive and torrential are also associated with an impaired outcome. And this means that probably in the context of intervention, we need to subclassify patients with severe tricky speed regurg into three different categories. Regarding the analysis that is important for uh, surgery, we can say that the annulus is not circular. The dilatation will depend on the etiology of the uh, tricky speed regurg. And you can see here in this slide that, of course, where is the dilatation differs according to the etiology. But what is important is the fact that we, when we compare to the surgical measurements, if we want to consider that the tricky speed annulus dilates along the free wall of the ventricle and with the largest diameter, which is between the anterior septal and the anterior posterior commissure, we can say that if we want to measure using 2D echo, the real tricky speed annulus, we need to use the subcostal view. And there you will get the longest diameter. So multiparametric imaging, multimodality imaging, and clearly the role of echo is for quantification. The role of maybe MRI is also a bit for quantification, but mainly for the effect or the impact on uh, the uh, different structure like the right ventricle, the vena cava, et cetera. Now, what about the outcome? Regarding the outcome, if you have a significant tricky speed rigor, the outcome is impaired. If you operate the patient, still the outcome is impaired. And when we look at the mortality rate, the mortality rate of the intervention is about 8-10%. And this has not changed over the last few decades. And also in this case, and in these patients, you can see that factors associated with mortality are mainly related to the severity of symptoms, 
the severity of right ventricular dysfunction, of liver dysfunction, and also the mechanism of tricuspid rigor, this means that actually we really operate too late these patients. Regarding now isolated tricuspid rigor, when you operate on the tricuspid valve and you compare this with medical treatment, of course, the outcome is not improved by the surgical treatment. And this should open the door for new therapeutic strategies as the transcatheter approach. So I would like to conclude that tricuspid valve is a really something very complex. And the, the anatomy is highly variable. Secondary tricuspid regurge, of course, is the most frequent etiology of tricuspid regurge. It is highly prevalent with a poor outcome. Multimodality imaging should be used and is key to assess the tricuspid rigor severity. And regarding the treatment, of course, we have some option for surgery and some indication, but maybe here is the open door for percutaneous option. Thank you for your attention. This is, a, again, this shows that we are really live. So now we have the opportunity to discuss with you uh, your presentation, which is very complete, uh, but in a live fashion. And I would like to be provocative with you. You mentioned uh, the guidelines. And uh, uh, first of all, the guidelines, uh, you know, they, they don't uh, speak too much about tricuspid because there is not so much evidence. But then you also mentioned one point, which is uh, to me very interesting, that to, to start the discussion, you start from three points. The severity of TR, you need to be able to, to judge in severity, you need to be able to assess RV function, and you need to uh, take into consideration pulmonary hypertension. All the three aspects that you mentioned remain very controversial. For instance, uh, what is your uh, method to measure RV function in your practice? Uh, first of all, Francesco, just to confess something, I was part of these uh, guidelines, not the new one that are uh, uh, being updated, but uh, I was in charge of tricuspid valve, and I'm sorry, we had a really short chapter, you remember that. Huh? Uh, now regarding uh, right ventricular function, this uh, really is something key to assess, but it's very difficult to assess. Uh, often what we consider in practice is to use always a, a, like a multi-parametric approach and multi-modality imaging. So, of course, first of all, the first imaging modality is always echo. With echo, you have to consider some dimension. You have to consider maybe the fractional area change. You have to consider maybe the right ventricular strain. But often it's not enough to have an idea of the presence of uh, some degree of... Uh, I would say remodeling and also some degree of fibrosis of the right ventricle. Maybe here, if we want to go further, we will need to have an idea of the presence of uh, some degree of fibrosis. And for that, maybe MRI could be used to assess not only the right ventricular volume and remodeling, but also the presence and extension of uh, right ventricular fibrosis, because I'm pretty sure that if you have a severe remodeling process, but without severe fibrosis, maybe the patient could still benefit from some degree of tricuspid regurgitation reduction with uh, some uh, uh, percutaneous intervention. But in the contrary, if you have severe fibrosis of the right ventricle, I'm not sure that uh, reducing tricuspid regurgitation will improve the outcome of the patient. So here we need to think largely and not like close to one technique, but also to include a multi-parametric and multi-modality imaging for the assessment of this difficult entity that is the right ventricle. Now, Patrizio, uh, thank you, first of all, for this uh, question, which remains at the end uh, open uh, for, uh, for multiple discussions. But I, I ask you another difficult question. Uh, now, you said multiple times we operate too late. And this is something that we all experience, particularly now with the new devices, because we get this referral for uh, patients who are really at the end stage of their disease. Now, what is, in your opinion, the right time to intervene? Is it before symptoms? Is it before uh, uh, organ failure? It is because of right ventricular remodeling. What is your target? I think we should still still stick to guidelines 
Of course, even regarding medical treatment, the sole treatment that is accepted right now by the American guidelines is diuretics and is a class 2 indication. There is no mention in the European guidelines about medical treatment. So first of all, of course, always treat perfectly the patients. Now, when is the right timing is an open question. Uh, if you wait too much regarding the severity of a remodeling, if you wait for liver dysfunction, uh, if you wait for a severe remodeling of the tricuspid valve, of course, you are too late. So I think in the near future, we will, with the experience of uh, treating these patients with advanced right ventricular dysfunction, tricky speed triggers, et cetera, we will have some ideas about the right timing of intervention. Now it's too early. Of course, I can tell you that we need to operate before all this, the liver dysfunction, before severe remodeling. But to give you cutoffs when uh, it's impossible right now, that's uh, mainly a clinical judgment still uh, today. Yeah? Thank you, Patrizio. So I think uh, uh, we can move forward, but there will be still time for more discussion after the other two presentations. And I would like to involve now uh, Philip Lourdes to introduce us to the uh, TriClip G4 platform. Uh, Philip. Dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to present to you the latest development in the field of transcatheter edge to edge repair the TriClip G4 device to treat tricuspid regurgitation. These are my disclosures. Now, the TriClip G4 device builds on the previous version of the TriClip, a device which was designed to meet the specific needs when performing interventions in the right heart. We have a S and L knob, septal and lateral. And this knob allows us to get a perfect trajectory of the device in two planes as now demonstrated on the right, turning the knob towards lateral, we move away from the septum as demonstrated on echo in the very right. And this allows us to get a perfect 90 degree trajectory of the device with, in relation to the tricuspid valve annulus, which facilitates the procedure a great deal. Now, what's been specifically new about the TriClip G4 device is the fact that it now comes in four different sizes. In addition to the NT and XT, we now have the ability to choose clips with a greater width, having now available the NTW and the XTW, allowing us to create even larger tissue bridge and thereby be more um, effective. Apart from the, from the size, and the dimensions of the tri-clip. We also now have the possibility of a controlled cripper actuation, meaning that the crippers can be steered independently, allowing to engage leaflets sequentially on the device, or if needed, perform a single leaflet optimization. And as with the previous versions, we do have um, cripper design to distribute forces in a way to be as atraumatic to the leaflets as possible. So in summary, the new and latest development in the field of transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair to treat tricuspid regurgitation, the TriClip G4 device with the ability of um, controlled gripper actuation and four different sizes to tailor the therapy to the specific anatomy of the patient. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome at Heart Center Leipzig for a TriClip Gen 4 implantation to treat tricuspid regurgitation. I have with me my dear friends and colleagues, Christian Besler, David Holzai. We will be supported throughout the procedure by Professor Ender, who will guide us through the um, case on echo. And, and without further ado, I'm going to ask Christian to present us the patient's details, please. Thank you, Philip. The patient we are treating today is an 84-year-old female patient with a BMI of 27.1 kilogram per square meter. She presented to hospital with a worsening dyspnea on exertion, currently in functional class 3 and pitting edema of both legs. The patient is known for long, long 
Extending arterial hypertension and permanent uh, atrial fibrillation in 2014, re she received an mid LAD PCI. Um, she's currently treated uh, by a vitamin K antagonist therapy. She's on an ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, statin, and congestion is currently treated by 40 milligrams of toracemide in this patient. Right heart catheterization in this patient ruled out significant pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vascular resistance was in the normal range, cardiac index was 2.2 and right atrial pressure tracings showed um, ventricularization of right atrial pressures with accentuation on deep inspiration. Transthoracic echocardiography displayed by atrial enlargement, right ventricle was uh, borderline dilated, left ventricular systolic function was preserved, Tapsy was mildly impaired, was about 13 to 40 millimeters, and already on transthoracic echocardiography, we observed significant functional tricuspid regurgitation, as we will see in a second on TOE. The patient managed to walk uh, 244 meters on a six-minute walk test and reported severe dyspnea on exertion. Anti-pro BNP levels were elevated. Um, she had uh, CKD stage three with an EGFR of 54 milliliters per minute and um, operative risk scores were increased. This case was discussed in our local heart team. We decided to go for a transcatheter approach in this patient and to use the next generation triclip device. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. So we're now going to ask uh, Jörg Ender to show us the pathology. So good morning. As you can see here, a mid-esophageal four-chamber view, a biatrial enlargement. And you see here in the X-plane a huge gap between the leaflets. We measured that with 1.1 centimeter. In a color doppler, you see a huge uh, trigaspid regurgitation. We measured an effective regurgitation orifice area of 1.9 square centimeter, biplane vena contractor of uh, 16, and you see a mean pressure gradient of one. What you see in transgastric is the septal leaflet. You see the anterior leaflet divided into an anterior part and the mural segment, and here the posterior segment and the corresponding tricuspid regurg, which goes all along from the septal posterior to the anterior septal part of the valve. We have a holosystolic backflow into the hepatic veins. I show you the 3D. You see the anterior septal commissure over there. That is the septal leaflet, the posterior leaflet, the anterior part of the anterior leaflet, and the mural part. And you see that huge gap corresponding also in uh, the color Doppler. Thank you very much. So we we have a case, so it's in between massive and torrential, is that correct? Yeah. I think from the effective regurgitation orifice, it's torrential. From a biplane vena contract, it would be massive, so something between massive and torrential. Okay, so we normally we use now a five grade grading scheme to quantify tricuspid regurg. It's certainly more challenging anatomy. We have borderline gaps. And just to set out expectations, we here are aiming to reduce TR down to moderate, which would mean that we bring it down two to uh, three grades, which normally corresponds in, in clinical improvement. Christian, strategy? We have a, a four leaflet valve. We have a very broad jet here uh, from the anterior septal to the posterior septal commissure. I would, I would aim for a, a, a two uh, device strategy with the uh, implantation of the first device in the anterior septal septal commissure, relatively central, and then um, maybe a second device, muroseptal. Yeah, that's what we are going to do. We have available now the Gen 4 triclip device, which comes in four different sizes. So we can um, create even larger tissue bridges by now choosing an XTW, so the clip with long arms, but also an increased width of six millimeter. And we're gonna start with that one to, to have a nice tissue bridge and bring together the anterior and, le and septal leaflet as much as possible. We're probably gonna aim for simultaneous leaflet grasping to start with, but if necessary, we have with the new generation also the possibility of an, a controlled gripper actuation, meaning that we could get one leaflet in first and then swing over to the other. So what we've done so far is we, we punctured the right femoral vein, we advanced the, the guide into the right atrium, and we're now gonna advance the triclip Gen 4 XTW 
through the guide into the right atrium. Okay, so with all of these steps, everything under fluoro and most importantly, echocardiographic guidance, the device is leaving the guide now. We bring the guide back to neutral, make sure that we're not pushing towards the septum. We then advance further until we are in straddling position and then we steer down towards the tricuspid valve by using the flex knob on the system. Okay, and then we'd ask Echo to go to an X-plane view. Once we are on that plane, we spend quite some time to make sure that we achieve a truly orthogonal alignment of the device in respect to the tricuspid valve annulus. So you can see that on the right, the device runs very smoothly in a 90 degree fashion into the tricuspid valve. And on the left, I think we still have a little bit of, an, of a bend. So we're gonna pull back the device slightly, release some flex. What we can also do with this device, we can introduce on the guide some lateral motion, which will facilitate or which will help us to move away a little bit from the septum as shown on the right, especially in those cases where you have what's often referred to as a septal hugging. So I think this is fine. We then open the device. So we'll make sure that we have the two clip arms nicely being visualized on the right, on the grasping view. Then we go for a controlled cripper actuation to assess which cripper is which one. Here you can see the septal cripper is moving down. And then the other one should be the anterior, just in case if we might decide to do a sequential leaflet engagement on the device. To avoid any trouble, we cross the valve with the device being closed. Then we go to a transgastric view and only after we ensure that we are in the right position, we open the device. So we're gonna cross now, as you can see here. You can see the device now being in a central position. We're gonna move a little bit further into the antraceptal commissure. And to do that, I'm gonna move everything in, as you can see now on echo and on fluoroscopy. Now we are in the antraceptal commissure or between antra and septal leaflet. We open the device now, so on fluoro. We now see the device being opened. I move back and here you can see now the clocking of the device. It is sort of a 2.30 to, to 8.30 orientation, which is correct because we would like to be in a 90 degree orientation or clocking with respect to the line of cooptation between anterior and septal leaflet. The anterior leaflet is already limited in motion, suggesting that that leaflet is already on. So the next step will be to go up again into a mid-esophageal view. Now we have, a, I think, a very nice view. You can see the, the, the grasping view on the right. The anterior leaflet is already on the device. We move further up. We have the anterior on and now we try to swing over. We now go for simultaneous grasping first. Septal is still a bit curling. I think it would be nice to, before we close the device, just to make sure that the clocking is fine. So can we go to uh, transgastric again, please? You can see that there's restricted motion of both the anterior and the septal leaflet, suggesting that both leaflets are on. We have a correct clocking in relation to the line of cooptation. So we're gonna now move up the echo probe to mid esophageal view. So here we see both leaflets engaged on the device. We're gonna bring down both crippers. All right, and then we close the device. We do that slowly and observe the tension on the leaflets building up, which is a good sign indicating that there's enough leaflet in. But okay, the device is closed now and now it's time to assess everything. So you see in the transgastric view that the anterior part of the leaflet runs nicely into the clip as well as the septal part. And if I move the probe slightly, you see in the color Doppler that uh, the regurgitation jet has decreased significantly. So we measured in the mid-esophageal view an uh, effective regurgitation orifice area of 0.35. The hepatic vein flow 
Before it was holosystolic backflow, now we have late systolic backflow. If you can stay just with that front gastric view, I think this is something very important because at first it shows that even away from the site of clip implantation, you can get a reduction in TR by reducing the gap and the reduction of gap is now is here established by pulling over the RV free wall towards the septum with a device which has the longer clips and an increased width, creating a larger tissue bridge and therefore should um, facilitate the reduction in annular dimensions even more so. so I think we, we achieved here what we hoped for, place the first device, reduce TR to a degree we are ha very happy here. Okay, it is released. Both leaflets are nicely in. And on fluoro, it's, it appears to be stable, no rocking, which is good. Okay, let's go to a transgastric view again to, to reassess anatomy and then plan for the second clip placement. Okay, so as seen before, reduction in general gap. And this is where we're going to aim now for the second implant. I'm not sure about the landing zone in, at that mural leaflet. And there are many cords. So I probably prefer to go with an XT device. So we are ready for the implant of the second device. Pretty much the same steps as for the first device. What is a little bit easier is the fact that now we have a good landing zone on fluoroscopy with the first clip being already in place. Commissural view again, an X-plane view. To align the device. So the device is nicely seated within the right atrium just above the tricuspid valve. We're gonna open now and check the clocking. On the grasping view on the right, we can see both clip arms indicating that, that this is the right clocking. And we cross the tricuspid valve again with the device being closed, even more so for the second device with one device already being in place. And we are gonna ask for a breath hold now, just before we cross. Now we are gonna cross the, uh, the valve carefully. Echo and fluoro guided. Okay, we are below. Now we go to transgastric view, please. We open the device now, please. Okay, now we can see the, the clocking, which again is um, two to eight o'clock. Okay, let's move up into the um, mid-esophageal view, please. Okay, anterior is on. I think we can close the device a little bit with more of a V-shape. Let's double check that on a transgastric, please. Because septal is difficult to see. Okay, that, that's, that, that looks good. Let's go up again to a mid of a gel. We bring down the crippers now simultaneously because we have both leaflets on. As you can see now. And now we close the device. So in the transgastric view, you see that the septal leaflet as well. You see the septal leaflet as well as the antrip leaflet of the tricuspid valve runs nicely into the clip. Transgastric in the color Doppler, you see another reduction of the tricuspid regurge. You see no systolic uh, backflow in the hepatic vein, and now we go live. We don't have any regurge at the anteroceptal commissure, which is nice, and a residual central regurgitation. Um, I think the placement, the placement is fine. We have both leaflets nicely in. The position is, is, is again, antraceptally, not so much moral, but I think it, it did what we wanted to do. It further decreased TR. Okay, so release it. Okay, perfect. So again, final arm angle. Okay, looks good. So the removal of the lock line. Second final arm angle, it's also good. Okay. So remember with the Gen 4, we don't have to re remove the, the crimper line, but it will be automatically be de-detached. Once we release the device, we pull back the crippers and then we can pull out everything with the line being into the system and no further retraction necessary. So we pull out the pin now, okay? Then the crippers go back. Crippers go back. And then okay. the device is released. Perfect. On fluoro, first view always on fluoro, that looks good. Both devices are moving throughout the cardiac cycle, but they're not rocking, they appear to be pretty stable.
now we see the result in the transgastric view, a marked reduction of TR compared with pre-op. This is the pre-op. The same in 3D, that is the pre-op uh, vena contractor area in 3D. And here you see it after placing the two G4 clips. And we measured a effective regurgitation orifice area with PISA of 1.1 square centimeter, which means it's a reduction from massive to torrential down to mild. So a good result. Yeah, thank you. In general, I believe that this lady will benefit from, from the reduction in TR. I would like to thank my fantastic team and um, you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, well done, uh, Philip. Obviously, we have seen uh, a, a, a experienced uh, operator, experienced center uh, performing a very smooth procedure. Let me ask you a very simple and quick question. So what do you think is the main advantage of having now G4 for tricuspid? Yes. <clears throat> well, first of all, it gives us more options, right? We, we have now four sizes. I general, I normally use always the, the XT because, um, and that's what I've learned by listening to my dear surgical colleagues, it is of great advantage to create a Coaptation length as large as possible, and I think that that's um, that's easier to do so with the with the clip with longer arms. But then, secondly, and that's also something you've seen in that case, in order to be effective, you have to pull over the RV free wall towards the septum to reduce the anatomy. And I believe, and I would think so. Obviously, we just started with that device, but I, I assume that with an XTW, you create a larger tissue bridge which should help to, um, to pull over the RB3 wall in an effective and, and safe manner. So you could easily imagine that the XTW will be our workhorse in, in the future, given the fact that there's enough landing zone. And you've seen it for the second one. I've, I've chosen the, the, um, the XT because I wasn't sure that the septal and the more leaflet will give us um, enough landing zone for, for the um, larger width. And then um, the second advantage, obviously, is the possibility to have um, controlled clipper actuation to, to get um, the leaflets in either sequentially or what's probably more important is um, after simultaneous grasp to do, to do a single leaflet optimization. If you, if you think that it would be beneficial to get one leaflet further in, just a, a, a larger bit of leaflet, and that's something um, which can be extremely helpful. So um, you didn't mention the third uh, um, feature, which is uh, available in G4, is uh, continuous pressure monitoring. Uh, but honestly, I also don't use it so much because we don't. We still uh, struggle with other issues in tricuspid. But do you use uh, continuous pressure monitoring to guide your decisions? <laughs> Yes, we, we do so. I mean, um, we, we have the benefit of normally getting really great echo images, but but it's it's, it's difficult to, to assess TR, especially once you have uh, two or three clips in there. So, and there, um, changes in, in pressure traces can be extremely helpful. In addition to what, what I really like as well is to, to look for, for flow and reversal in the hepatic veins. And if, if that gets better than normally, that's also a good sign and it's easy to do. Then the final uh, comment, or let's say, question is: I have seen in your in your case, you use mainly two images. You use the uh, inflow outflow or intercommissural view, whatever you want to call it, uh, and then you use a transgastric view. Um, this is very, I, I think, is very simple approach. Uh, do you see any reason to uh, switch to three D in any case, or uh, is it something that you don't need? I think 3D is great to, to appreciate the overall anatomy a little bit better, but at the point where you try to get the leaflets on, when you have to assess how much leaflets you really have on, then I think it's, it's I, I, I really like to rely on the, on the higher um, spatial resolution of, of 2D then. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, <clears throat> something we should probably communicate is that 3D uh, imaging on a tricuspid valve is not as good as you get it in uh, in the in the mitral for many reasons, and so uh, for those who need to start uh, these procedures, you need to really understand. You need to learn different imaging guidance 
you need to uh, understand uh, the transgastic views, uh, as you have seen uh, uh, done by Philip. Uh, uh, you can assess uh, lifted insertion. You can assess a lot of things uh, via transgastic, but you need to to get used to it. Uh, I think imaging plays a major role, and I think uh, I thank you uh, for the moment, uh, Philip, because we go for uh, the next speaker, which is the one who. Uh, has been preaching us a lot that if you don't get good imaging, you should should not even start the procedure. So Georg uh, Nikening is, uh, again, one of those who really initiated this field, and uh, he will give us some advices on how to build a successful program uh, based on, uh, on his own experience. So Georg, now it's uh, your time to give us a lecture. Well, thank you very much for having me to discuss with you this given topic. Uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. Um, as you all know, tricuspid regurgitation is very frequent. And what you are looking here is the recurrency of tricuspid regurgitation after open heart surgery. And no matter which strategy you are using, there's a recurrency rate of up to 20, 30 percent after five years. And if you look at the next slide, you can see on the left side, concentrate on the left side, you can see mortality rates over the last 10 years or so after open heart surgery of tricuspid regurgitation. And you can easily appreciate it. It's way up. It's almost 20%. And therefore, we are desperately seeking for other solutions to uh, treat dedicatedly tricuspid regurgitation for example, with a transcatheter minimal invasive system. And one system to be used is a leaflet device and specifically the triclip device. And that was tested within the Triluminate study. The Trilu Triluminate study was a rigorously controlled study without placebo control, I should say, in 85 patients in 21 sites in Europe and also in the United States, enrolling patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation and symptoms and, the, and just the usual exclusion criteria you can see down at the bottom of the slide. These are already the, the results of the Triluminate study. On the left side, you can see that we were able to reduce tricuspid regurgitation by one grade in 85% of the patients and by two grade in 62% of the patients. So quite successfully in that very early experience. And on the right side, you can see the baseline data and the data for two years in a more granular fashion. On the left bar, you can see that almost every patient had a severe or higher tricuspid regurgitation at entrance. And after two years, most of the patients, 60% of the patient, had a moderate or lower tricuspid regurgitation at presentation, which is quite encouraging for such an early trial. And this was followed by a nice improvement in clinical performance of the patients. On the left side, you can see New York Heart Glass Association before the procedure, almost 70% of the patients in New York Heart 3 to 4. And after two years, the majority of the patients in New York Heart 1 and 2. And that is mirrored by the KCCQ score and also by the six-minute walking, six walking test, which is depicted here. A nice gain of 60 meters over, over tier two years, which yields, the high, yields a highly significant result for that, for that measure to treat tricuspid regurgitation. And here you can see a hospitalization rate for heart failure. On the left side before the treatment, the year before the treatment, and on the right side two years after the treatment. This is not really scientific evidence, but it's nice to see and it generates hypothesis that this treatment may also reduce hospitalization for heart failure. So may I summarize this part of my presentation? Uh, TR reduction was uh, reduced at 30 days and through two years in a sustained fashion in the, in the frame of the Triluminate study. There is also improvement in functional status and, and quality of life. And we saw an overall reduction in heart failure hospitalization 
be reminded that this was not a controlled study with a placebo arm or just a medical treatment arm. But most importantly, we didn't see, I didn't show you this data specifically, no safety issues whatsoever, no procedural mortality. Second uh, piece of data I would like to share with you is derived from the be right study. That is a post-marketing study, a real-world study, if you will, planned in 200 su subjects in 40 sites. To be included are patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, and it was looked at, at the procedural success and also at other clinical endpoints, such as mortality, for example, and severe pulmonary hypertension, for example, or severe diseases on the left heart side was an exclusion criteria. And these are the baseline criteria within this real world setting of the first 75 patients, if you will. Age roughly at, at almost 80 years, uh, lots of comorbidities, 90% with atrial fibrillation, uh, um, equal distribution between male and female, which is kind of unusual. Usually we have more female in such a study. Uh, no left heart disease issues, but still an anti-pro-BNP of almost 3,000. So very sick, a very sick patient group. And if you look at the results, this is the implant success, which was 100% true also for the acute procedural success. And the device time, importantly, was less than 80 minutes, which makes it a, a pretty feasible uh, procedure in, in a daily routine basis, on a daily routine basis, not comparable to other procedures also to be used in the tricuspid space. And these are the results, and they remind me of the triluminate the result. They are almost the same. Here we are using the novel iteration of the triclip, mostly the XTR clip in the tri clip position, which gives even better results. One grade was reduced um, in, in the majority of, of, the, of the patients. And if you look on the, on, and, and also in, in most patients, there was a reduction of more than, than two, as you can see down here in 84% of the patients with at least a grade one reduction. And if you look at the, at the scheme, at the at, at core lab adjudicated data here, you can see that every patient had a severe or higher tricuspid regurgitation. And after the procedure that was discharged, 84% uh, of the patients had TR of 84, of, of moderate or less, excuse me, remained with severe or higher grade tricuspid regurgitation. This was followed by a nice improvement in, cl in the clinical situation as assessed by New York Heart Class Association. And again, we didn't have any safety issues no cardiovascular mortality, no MACE rate whatsoever, uh, just a few major bleeding, which we are not fatal for this, for this patient. So an extremely safe procedure. And therefore, let me summarize uh, that in this real world setting, most of the patients to be treated with a triclip are elderly patients. The triclip procedure was associated with 100% implant and acute procedural success rate, and also a nice reduction of, of a TR to moderate or less in 84% of the patients without any evidence for safety issues. These were all uncontrolled studies and therefore we're desperately waiting for the results of, a, of this vigorously controlled triluminate pivotal trial. In this trial, we, will, we are randomizing right now and recruiting patients to medical treatment or medical treatment uh, and the triclip procedure in patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. And we are looking at heart clinical endpoints and also at clinical improvement of heart failure and heart failure hospitalization, but also mortality. And this will ultimately tell us whether this procedure not only improves the clinical situation, but also saves life. Thank you very much for your attention. So now it's uh, your time to uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on this data. So uh, again, I would like to mention the importance of patient selection. And uh, can you tell me, based on your expertise and also on the data that you just showed, can you give us some uh, suggestions on what is the ideal patient for this procedure? 
I think the ideal patient is 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 a patient. I'm just looking at the anatomy. Is a patient has a distinct lesion, uh, supposedly and preferentially at the anterior septal region of the valve, because that's easy to access and then usually easier to image. And then it should be uh, probably a patient with not a torrential TR. Uh, we know from, from our own painful experience and also from the data from the triluminate study that these patient, patients can come out with a moderate TR, but usually they don't. And patients with severe or severe to massive TR can be treated more successfully. So I would treat first of all patients with severe to maybe massive TR, and then they should have a, a distinct lesion to be attacked by the lethal device. And, and maybe a third reason anatomically or third point would be that free leaflet free leaflet valves are easier to treat than four or five leaflet valves and then of course there are all these clinical issues if the patient has a reduced life expectancy or other severe comorbidities which have to be treated first then it's not an ideal candidate okay so and i think it's time now to involve almost everybody in this in this discussion and i will ask a very general question to all of you. So uh, I think we are uh, so-called experts in this field, let's say, because we are very much involved in, uh, in this kind of procedures and this kind of patients. Yeah, but the question is, uh, we, we become every day more convinced that this is a therapy that should be uh, offered to patients uh, in uh, with with uh, with tricuspid disease, the question, uh, and I will start again the, the round uh, around the answer from each of you. Uh, what is the main limiting factor to convince uh, the the uh, the referring physicians, the physicians who see these patients, probably the family physicians, that tricuspid disease is a problem? So let's start with uh, Patrizio. Probably you are. Uh, uh, you have been giving the first lecture, the one uh, introductory. So, pro and you said they come too late. So, what is missing? First of all, is missing your voice. You need to unmute yourself. My voice, excellent. <laughs> now, what I was saying is that what is clearly missing is first is the awareness about the disease and the severity of the disease, because often even general practitioner or general cardiologist. They do not think that uh, having a tricuspid regurg uh, is maybe something associated with a worse outcome. And we need to change this paradox. That's important. So we need clearly to say that if you have a tricuspid regurg, regardless finally of the severity, you have to follow up the patients very carefully to identify those who will benefit from an early intervention and don't wait too much. That's I think the, the most important message that we can deliver to these uh, physicians, but if um, they do not recognize, they just treat medically, they say, okay, with diuretics, the patient is going well, and we can stay like this. But we know that if we do this, at the end of the day, the patients will end up having a more severe tricuspid regurg, and tricuspid regurg beget tricuspid regurg, tricuspid annulus dilatation, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to convince that that tricuspid regurg is something that is uh, uh, worse in terms of outcome if you have this not treated, not carefully followed. So, and Philip, let, let me uh, ask you the same question, but in a little bit different uh, uh, fashion. So is it probably missing the the knowledge that we can treat this, this patient safely. The safety of this procedure is probably an important uh, message. Can we, can we declare that treating tricuspid today is safe if we use, a, for instance, a triclip system? Yes, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. In, in with some experience with good imaging, and that's been proven in all studies, the procedure has been extremely safe. To be, to be effective and to, to bring it down to moderate or less, that also depends a bit on patient selection, or actually a great deal on patient selection. But um, regardless, in all studies, the procedure has been 
extremely safe. And um, the, the awareness of how much TR affects these patients will come as soon as you see the, the effect of the treatment. Because as long as you bring down TR to, to moderate or mild, the clinical benefit is almost for granted, I have to say. So it, it's just a very bad thing to have right heart failure. And if you, if you, if you improve right heart failure, then um, there, there's almost no doubt that patients will, will, will notice and, and will tell you. Yeah, that's a good point that I will probably uh, bounce to Georg uh, on this point. Uh, when we talk about awareness, I, I share with you my ignorance. To be honest, uh, uh, before treating these patients, I thought the problem of tricuspid is uh, leg edema. Uh, but the more I treat these patients, I see that they improve uh, also uh, other left, commonly left-sided symptoms. So maybe it would be nice for, to hear from you uh, what are the the clinical improvements that you see in your practice in these patients. So can you really help uh, us to understand what kind of good we give to these patients? Besides the reduction of TR, this is just an image. But besides what we do, what we what you see? I mean, what we see in the in the studies and what we also see in the in the, in the hospital is uh, improvement in the heart failure symptoms. Um, Tricuspid regurgitation leads to the typical heart failure symptom, uh, symptoms such as uh, dyspnea, uh, fatigue, and, and also edema, ascites, uh, liver dysfunction, and for for and also renal uh, dysfunction. And this all can improve over time after reducing TR. And I think this will will build awareness also because this has been clearly shown in the clinical studies so far, but so far also in an uncontrolled fashion. We have don't have the placebo control. So therefore, I would like to add two points, how we can build more on the trust of the GPs to refer the patients to us. First of all, we need to show that this is treatment is really efficacious. And so far, we have only this uncontrolled studies, but the good message is, that the, the pivotal trials are ongoing uh, very, very, very swiftly with various devices. So we learned our lessons from, from the last 10 to 15 years and we'll have this data available very soon. And if there is an, an advantage in heart failure hospitalization on top of medical treatment or even in mortality, then probably GPs are going to be forced to be more aware. And second point is we need to deliver excellent results. If, if we get referrals from a GP and we send the patient back with, uh, with still severe TR, if we treat, for example, two far gone patients, this is not going to build trust. And therefore, we need, to, we need to try to be optimal in, the, in an excellent fashion. And this calls also for a centralization of this treatment. It shouldn't be done in any institution. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot for your uh, final comments and thank you everybody for an outstanding session where I think we learned uh, again uh, the importance and the burden of tricuspid uh, regurgitation in, in the population and the effect of uh, the presence of TR in, in prognosis and symptoms. Uh, I think uh, Philip shows, uh, showed us uh, uh, how to perform this procedure effectively and safely. And Georg gave us uh, important uh, data to support uh, indications. Also uh, waiting for uh, the, final, uh, the final conclusive data that probably will come from, uh, from, uh, from randomized trials. And uh, with this, I think uh, I would like to close the session and thank everybody for your attention and look forward for more data in the future. Thank you.